seeing my dad cry, it's like the worst feeling. And again, we still have these conversations where sometimes he cries and I'm just like, dad, I forgive you. Like, Mm -hmm. I want you to know you're better and that's all I want you to be. When it comes to the things that you deal with in your childhood, it tends to have a big impact on who we are as adults. However, those things don't define who we are as people. When you discover self-awareness and you choose growth, you get this beautiful opportunity to decide for yourself who you're going to be. No one knows this better than my good friend, Eladia Heredia. She is a videographer who dedicates herself to creating and sharing stories with the world. She talks to me a lot about how big of an inspiration her grandpa is. See, he recorded himself doing everything. So growing up, she got to see him in his youth. She knew that she wanted this for her kids as well. And that sparked her interest in videography in the first place. Her life is one that is filled with twists and turns, but Eladia has managed to persevere through some of these hardships and through a lot of hard work, she's defining on her own who she's going to be as a person. Eladia, I'm so glad that we're here. Hello, hello. So, um, tell me, is it Eladia, Hillary, Hill? I've heard a lot of different names. I've called you Eladia from the beginning, but yes. sometimes when I'm talking about you to other people I know you, there's a little bit of confusion because of that. Is there one that you prefer? Yeah, Eladia is definitely the go-to name. I have, you know, done my own, you know, searching of myself and Eladia just fits me a lot mm. better as a grown-up. Like I said, I'm as a kid, it was a big Hillary thing. My family always called me Hillary. My mom, my dad, my grandparents, my sisters, and my closest friends always call me Hillary. Um, But now that I've kind of grown up and, you know, started serving, actually, I was like, hi, my name's Ilaria. I would go to the table, hi, my name's Ilaria, instead of saying Hillary. And everybody's just all like, why is it Ilaria now? And I'm just like, girl, that's my name. Right. So, yeah, it's it's definitely an adjustment that I've, I mean, and the choice that I've made were uh, even... Juan, he calls me Laria too, and my girls call me Hillary, but... Yeah, and you know, I think it's interesting because once I started realizing that people were calling you Hillary, I'm like, oh, well, you know, Hillary's good too, Mm -hmm. but for me, I think it was a choice of like, no, I got to honor that too, because... It's like respect. Yeah, Yeah. I went through that same thing. I mean, my name is Aaron, so it was like, it wasn't the same because that was easy to pronounce. People called me Aaron all the time, and that's what I was used to, but it was with with my last name. Mm -hmm. So the last name is pronounced Robles, Mm -hmm. strong, powerful, all that. But when I was young, it's that same thing. You know, you get the teachers that call you Robles, and I just kind of said... Okay. You know, like if if that's what makes sense to you, it's so hard to, so, you know, I went a long time kind of mispronouncing my own last Mm -hmm. name because it was like in Spanish, it's Aaron. In English, it's Aaron. Well, if I have the English first name, I also have the English last name. I think the older I got, the more I started saying like, no, I want to take a lot more ownership of that. But it's, it's hard, you know, I'm first generation. I learned English when I was like five, but then I was raised in an entire culture that was like very American. Mm -hmm. And because that's what I craved, like I want to be cool with y'all. It was like, let me not stand out. And And that's funny that you said that because my teachers will call me Hilaria, Hilaria, because that's how it kind of looks. Or when they would say it, they'd be like, make jokes like hilarious, like hilarious. And I'm just like trying to go along with the joke, but it's kind of like, dang, like I wish you guys would just, hey, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong instead of just making it a joke or something like making me feel uncomfortable. It's my first day of school and you're calling It's like, it's invalidating your identity. It's it's, just like you want to get away from the subject. All right, you can call me Hillary. Right. On to the next kid. And then, I mean, at some point you just start introducing yourself as that because yep. it's 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 easy. But, well, I mean, here we are a lot older, a lot wiser and, yes, and doing things the way that we want to do them. So I love that. So it's, it's fascinating because you and I 
haven't known each other for that long. I mean, we've known each other like maybe a year. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like you are like in so many ways like my spirit animal. Because whenever we chat, it's like same. we're on the same vibe. Like we're, we're, we're helping each other and inspiring each other. So it's interesting because I haven't known you for that long, but it's just kind of the kindred spirits. And yeah. I think it's this constant reminder of like time doesn't matter. You can know people for such a long time or for a little bit amount of time, and the vibe is the vibe. And I think that's something that's always been very present in in our aura. Right. But, okay, so you are doing a lot of different things. Yeah. You are now involved. You have the podcast. You have video work that you're doing. Yeah. And then you're like me. Your brain's always working. But Yeah, um, always trying to create something new. I know. And you always We're innovators. To, yeah. It's, it's exciting, a thing. Exciting, the yes. shiny. We love it. Um, it's a strength and a weakness. Depends yeah. on how oh, you yeah. manage it. But, you know, on top of that, you are a mother to yes. how many kids? Four kids. Four kids. Yeah. Ages? I have twins that are going to be eight um, next month and a uh, five-year-old daughter and then a going to be two-year-old son in December as well. So, yeah, I got my hands full. It's yeah. always a busy um, a busy household, and it's it never it never slows down. Like it's mm -hmm. a, it's something that you got to get used to, especially if you want it. You got to yeah. go for it and just feel comfortable with the movement. You got to make a nice routine with it. Well, I'm pretty sure every time you and I FaceTime, the girls come in and attack you at mm -hmm. some point. And, they want to know who I'm talking and to they're, all the they're time. They're super social because they're like, hey, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I, I love that. But OK, four kids, yeah. very time demanding ages. You're running a business, you have a podcast, and you're going to school. Yeah. That's a lot. Yes. So I want to kind of cover all of that, but I think, you know, like with anything, I want to figure out, you know, where those early days were that kind of led into everything you're doing now. So talk to me a little bit about the early days, your childhood. Where were you born? Talk to me a little bit about your family. Just introduce us to those early right. Eladia days. Um Eladia. So she was a very social person. And it's so funny that you brought up my kids first because they remind me so much of me when I was a, a kid. I was very social. I was very hyper all the time. And I wanted to, you know, be connected at everybody's hip. I wanted to know what everybody was doing because I wanted to see how can you do that? Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to be in that too. And it was, it, it's always been like that. So it's just funny to kind of see my kids doing the same things that I've wanted to do because, you know, I was always an active kid. So I always wanted to do like baseball. I loved mm -hmm. sports. I loved dancing. That was my thing. You're just always out there in the yeah, world. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was always such a bright time for me, you know, as a kid. So I had lots of friends. Mm. I was, um, I just, I grew up in a, in a good neighborhood, you know, I had a nice childhood. I had a big imagination. Like I was always um, outside. That was my thing. I always made friends. Um, I once I got out of school, I was outside, you know, um, and I made the best out of my childhood. And I always wanted to just live the day. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I no. guess you know, being busy was was always my thing. Yeah, and you definitely see it in, in those kids of yours. Yeah. So what did you spend your time doing as a kid? So you were outside a lot. You were involved a lot. I mean, what was your relationship with, like, uh, like your parents? Right. Um, because that's the other thing. Depending on, on who you are, you have some people that grew up very distant from their parents, right. other people that grew up really close. So tell me about kind of your relationship. What role did your parents play in you being that – girl that you just described. Right. So again, I think being social was because I just watched my mom being mm. social with everybody wanting to, I mean, everybody knew my mom and it was just because she was all around the city doing things with, you know, uh, sports and helping people and, and kids of like out of anything. I've met so many people because I grew up with them. She would help, um, do like community work and um, she had her own program. She, it was like 1993 when she started. I was born in 1993. So you got to think about it. She was in her infancy of her her business and her non-for-profit when I was around like four or five. So I kind of mm. grew up on it and I was always around her and by her side and kind of 
seeing how she um, wanted to make everybody her friend. She was, you know, a social butterfly. So, so I think that's... to see the cycle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's so funny because I grew up with two sisters and an older brother. And I think I was the closest to my mother just because of the fact that she was always around people. So that's what interested me of, like, just meeting different types of people. That was my thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was um, a big person on trying to help. I, I always wanted to help my mom. I always wanted to help. If you need anything, you just let me know. Mm. Okay, mom, I'm here. But um, yeah, I was. Um, I did a lot of like dancing. So my mom would get grants um, to buy outfits and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take on this opportunity. My uncle Sal Soto, he had he did fiesta for mm-hmm. Wayne's every year, and I was like ten years old when I first performed at the festival. And you got to think about it, those things were packed. Yeah. All right. So I'm out there performing, and I did that every year until I mean I had dance groups. I did it all through high school as well. I was just a very, you know, social person. But um, I don't remember too much of my father just because he worked a lot. So my mom worked a lot, but I was always with her. Right. So she was able to bring you exactly along with, along her. with and, her. And it sounds like you have, um, not only were you already social, mm-hmm. but you had those people that enabled you to be more social, mm-hmm. right? So so you talked to me a lot about um, your mom working with kids, giving back, things like that. But talk to me a little bit about what it was she was doing, why was it important, and how she got into that in the first place. Right. So my mother was a very... Um, troubled kid. She went through a lot through her childhood. Um, you know, just like molestation and um she was just traumatized. She didn't know how to handle it. And mm. there was a lot of things behind that, but you know, she got into trouble, you know, during her high school years. She started hanging out with the wrong people and getting into things that just caused even more um hardship in her life where she joined a gang and she was literally stripped of everything that, you know, she figured out from herself, you know, and, and that was in high school. So it's like, that was the most critical time of your life. Um, you already went through these, um, trauma traumas as a, as a child. So around like eight, nine, you know, around that time. And then, you start, you know, rebelling and getting into things where you think it'll help or people are being there for you when they're really not. Like getting into a gang, maybe it was a whole, um, maybe they will protect me. You know, yeah, maybe it was A sense like, of belonging, yes. a sense of something. Yeah. And I think that's what she wanted. She wanted to feel like she belonged somewhere because, again, there was things in her life that were not going as well with her parents and her family and the molestation came from her family. So it was just a big trust thing. She didn't know who to trust. And, you know, she, she talks about it, but doesn't talk too deep about it. But when she started this program, she did it to kind of like make up for her lost self. Mm. So she tried to help people find their selves and their issues. So she started at Geyer um, with, you know, doing projects like cars and, and she helped, um, you know, they were like adolescent boys. And then she started getting into other programs. But so boys and girls starting to getting there and she made a program called Hermanas where females came in and they were like sisters. You know, we all count on each other to talk about each other's problems. And I think those type of programs where you can kind of open up and she can kind of give her advice and use her experiences yeah. to kind of he- help heal and make a relatable space for, you know, people that were going through the same things. And I think that's a huge, you know, advantage for her. Not in like, not an advantage as in like, she's getting something out of it, but she used her experiences to help others. And I think that was her main goal. Yeah. And, and it, it's fascinating because the people who end up needing those things are the ones who know how to deliver it, yes. right? And that's one of those things where, like, 
kids just need to feel safe. They mm-hmm. need to feel loved and they need to feel safe. And when you don't get that, you know, that's where we develop all of these different ways to try and figure out how to do that. How do I stay safe? How do I feel protected? How do I? And when you don't have any life experience, you're just kind of left to your own devices. It's so easy to make those those decisions, right? And not everyone gets to escape those things. Love that. So, you, you know, that. being able to escape and then to go back and, and start giving back. I mean, that's such a strong why and from someone who understands. And it's so relatable, I think, to so many people, even in business, because we fill a void that we needed, mm-hmm. right? So we're always trying to say, oh, I needed this. How do I give that back? But it you was know. it was a fulfilling feeling for her. Yeah. And like you said, it was like the whole feeling of belonging. Like these people would call her mom. These mm-hmm. my grandmother, she um my grandmother was right by her side through the program, you know. She would bring her brothers and sisters into it just to give them kind of like a position and power. Yeah. And so all of us saw my mom in this position that helped people. So it was inspiring. You know, I grew up seeing my mother be this superwoman. And it was just like I think that's where I get a lot of my strength because I seen it growing up. And that wasn't just with my mother, but it was with my father. You know, I seen him bust his ass. So it's just like, that's all the mindsets I have. And just like you said, a lot of people don't have that. These people that were in her program, they didn't have a mom and dad that they would come home and be all lovey-dovey. But my mom gave them that. My grandmother gave them that. And I think everybody was fulfilled at the end of the day. And it was just me being able to witness that at my age, it was just I'm on I'm on a whole other level. People don't understand. Right. That was a privilege. It was a privilege. And you know, there was a lot of time in my life where my mom would work from school school hours, obviously, all I mean, all the kids are in school. She wouldn't get home till like ten o'clock. Mm. She didn't see my dad. Sometimes she would leave us at home. She didn't see us. Mm. So it was like a it, it tore a little bit of our family and a lot. And my dad still has a lot of, you know, a lot of anger towards like, he's like, you know, you, you love them more than us. And it was like, mm-hmm. it wasn't that at all. My mom had the best interest. Yeah. You know, it was just a very, um, she expressed it in a different way. And nobody will understand that until you were in one of those students' shoes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because you grew up in an environment with such a strong why, yes. you know, like Simon Sinek, start with why. It's Once I started reading that kind of material, it's like you realize you're in the best position to do something when you care about it. And your mom and what she dealt with, like I can't even imagine, number one, going through that. But number two, sitting in the sidelines because you're like, well, I don't have to deal with that anymore. So anyone else who's got to deal with it, that's their problem. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, we have to stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. And she knew how and she had the resolve, but there's only so many hours in a day. There's only so much you can do if you want to make an impact. And I mean, it's hard, you know, your family and your kids or people that aren't family, but they could die. They could be in bad situations or worse situations. And I think it's so easy for us to not understand it when we're kids. Like yeah, I, yeah. I, the older I get, the more I understand my parents, the yeah. decisions they had to make and how tough life is. And, you know, at the end of the day, mom knew you were at home. She knew you were good. She mm. knew you had enough to eat. These kids, not so sure. If it's right. not her, then who is it? So, but, you know, as a kid, I'm sure you felt that kind of like, why every mm-hmm. once in a while, right? Because oh, yeah. it seems like you were involved to a degree, but not always. Yeah, there were there were times where I wasn't involved and there were times like in, in high school, it's when she was getting to her end. So she had buildings where she would do these for years. She she had, I think, three different buildings on the south side of um uh of Fort Wayne, which she worked at Southside um the last couple of years when I was in high school. So I always saw my mom. I mm-hmm. I lived right by Northside, mm-hmm. but I went to Southside because my mom worked at Southside. So she wanted to keep an eye on us and yeah. all that stuff. So we would go to her center. And and so the last couple of years, she was just like, you know, getting down to her end. And my grandma was there as well. She was a teacher. But they would always call my grandma, grandma, or my mom, mm-hmm. mom. And it was just like, that's when I started to feel like, this is weird. Like, mm. I feel like I'm not getting enough attention. And in high school, you need that. Yeah. You need your mom uh, 
not just to care about your issues, just to love on you. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And I feel like that was my mom's top thing. She want, she was a fixer upper, mm -hmm. you know, like Hill, like tell me what's going on. Like, I'm like, mom, damn, just be a mom to me, right. you know? So it was like, I mean, we, and sometimes we do have our problems where we go back and forth and talk about that type of stuff. You know, m me and my mom used to be best friends mm. in, in those days, because again, I was next to her all the time, but it is it is what it is when it comes yeah. to those type of things. We and still it's, go it's, back and forth. It's so interesting because not everyone can say they were so close to their mother mm -hmm. or felt feelings of jealousy the way that, yeah. that you did. Um, not even with siblings, but just with all these. And I mean, I'm sure over the years, it's a lot of other kids. Yeah. So your mom played a pretty big role in your life. And yeah. it seems like you two are very similar and you got to see her kind of in, in her strong why and glory, oh, which yeah. kind of helped you say like, oh, no. I could do something like that. Um, talk to me a little bit more about your dad. You said hard worker, busting ass. What so was... my parents were together since they were 14 years old. Wow. They were together for a long time. So they grew up together. Mm. They grew up together. They were dating since 14. So hit her drama, trauma, not drama. <laughs> Shoot, probably drama too. A little bit mom. of both depends on the day, right? <laughs> exactly. Became his trauma and his drama. Mm. They again, fourteen years old. You're going through all these things while in a relationship. They had their first. My brother when he was when he uh, when they were twenty one. Mm -hmm. So twenty one, twenty two, when they had my brother. So again, she had her. She was building her career, trying to figure out what she wanted to do while having kids. And it was just a big, my dad didn't have that time to find his career and find himself. He had to provide for the family. He had to make it work. Yeah, he had to make it work. And all I remember of my dad is working. He was a janitor at Washington Center. And um, he was there. I actually went to elementary at Washington Center um, until I was in third grade. He was there. We'd go see him. You know, we'll go on the weekends to clean and all that good stuff. And my dad was just always a hard worker. He was all, he was the one that was on top of it. He was yeah. the one that was on top of money. He was the one who was budgeting. He was just he's just a very smart, strategic guy. He likes things clean, everything. But my my dad also was going through, you know, his growing up of life. And I think there was a lot of things that he didn't know how to control, which, you know, especially having kids and having a wife that was figuring out herself. She was just, he was just a very, um, he didn't want to talk about it, but he coped in a different way. Well, and I think the pressure of being the one that has to provide, yeah. right? At the end of the day, no matter what happens, no matter how you feel about it, you got to make money. You got to take care of it. So it's like sometimes you get in this position where it's kind of like, man, if I explore, I'm going to start feeling some type of way. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I got to get up and do this stuff whether I want to or not. So it, and then being with your mother for such a long time, so young, mm -hmm. they knew each other. Then, I mean, 21 is now that I'm at the age that I'm at, like 21 is very young to have a kid yeah. and you're still growing and yeah. changing. And then once you have a kid, it's, yeah. it's about the kid. So, and I think that was my dad a hundred percent. He never wanted to lose himself, but he was slowly losing himself. So mm. he, he was a big person. He liked to go play pool. So he'd go out on the weekends and, and go drink and he would go with his friends. He had like two best friends his whole life. We were all very, very close, but he was just a very like, um, once he was out, he was out. And when he came back, he didn't want to deal with home. Mm. It was just his escape. It was, he went to work and then on the weekends was his time. It, so it was just like a very routine um, life for him. Again, he was trying not to lose himself. So he would, you know, go do what he thought was kind of like spending time with himself, which was mm -hmm. going out with his friends and enjoying himself. But he had a very, I feel like he had a lot of trauma that he wasn't, you know. Dealing with. Dealing with at yeah. all. And and I, and till this day, he, he gets very emotional about it, you know, because he knows where he was. He yeah. knows, and he's very open with talking to me about how our childhood was because he was a very 
abusive father. And and I always talked to him about it. And I, I talked to my mom about it too. He that's all he saw as a as a child. Like he my grandfather drank. It was just a whole thing. Like it was a yeah. it was passed down. So when my, my dad would go out, he'd come home and if it wasn't clean or I mean, I can't even remember what the issues would be, but it would just be ass whippings all the time. Hmm. And I for a long time I thought it was just towards me because I would get it the worst, Aaron. Like I would get it bad. And I always remember that. And it's so it's so sad because it's like I try to m- remember the good stuff. And I do. Like I was remembering the other day that this the beatings would happen on a Saturday, but Sunday we had to wake up for church. So wow. he, yeah, so he'd he'd take us to church and like just you know I felt like it was like a God forgive me for beating the shit out of my kid, and we're gonna come together as a family and we're gonna spend time with our family and then let's go to the mall and let me buy something for them. Yeah, we're gonna to start ma- over. Yeah, right? start over fresh and then yeah something again would snap. And th- there was a time where you know I was in elementary school and I got my ass whooped so bad, where I couldn't go to school for a week because. M- there were marks all over my body. And my dad's look was just like a very blacked out, mm. you know, like, like he seen nothing. Lost in rage. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 100%. So, you so, just saying rage just put the picture in my in my head. Yeah, and, and it's crazy because like you said, trying to remember the good moments, but like that stuff gets imprinted. Which You know, it, it gets imprinted in your mind. Yeah, and which, again, I try not to you know, make that such a core thing of my father, but that's a lot of what I remember about my father. Like I am grateful for the person that he helped me be and what he did. And I, and now, like you said, you understand your parents, you understand and feel sorry for him. He was a child. I, I still feel like he's a child. Yeah. And he d- I don't think he understood the extent of how it was going to mark us yeah. as we grew up. Well, it's it's this thing because, you know, I've I've had a lot of that in, in my family too, you know, with, with my father and just kind of like the things you see growing up that just affect you in, in such a, a deep way. Things that like, it's like I was, like I'm there. Mm-hmm. I can close my eyes and see things so clearly. And, you know, a lot of therapy about that. Yeah. A lot of a lot of figuring out, a lot of anger, a lot of everything. But I think one of the things that I kind of start to, started to understand as I grew up and started going through my own healing is like you can't give what you don't have to give. And my dad was raised, um, you know, he used to get beat with two by fours. My dad ran away to America, you know, like he ran away to a different country and just – remembering and hearing the stories of how he grew up compared to the way we were raised, infinitely better, right? right? But my parents' focus growing up was, for, for us, was food, shelter. It was such a step up, but it's kind of like I had to let go a lot of the anger of, like, they didn't talk about mental health. Mm-hmm. You know, when he grew up, there was none of that. right? So he didn't understand a lot of those like different emotions that it, it was it was happy and angry mm-hmm. like there were two or three and you know so after a while i have to realize it's like man my parents made such a big sacrifice to put me in a position where i could even know what those things were and do better yes cuz now i go to therapy i read the books i understand you know all of this but that would have never happened if my parents didn't make the sacrifice to put me in a position. And like yours, say what you will, my dad worked. every. He did not go without a job. Right. And it's one of those things of like, it's so easy to like compare yourself to other people and say they didn't have to. But, you know, your parents made such a sacrifice to be better than what they, with the, with the little that they had. Yes. They did the best. And I think as we talk about it, that gets a little bit, um, easier to at least understand why it 100%. happened. So, I mean, what's your relationship with your dad now? So my dad is a very, gosh, I get it. He's an amazing man. And it's so funny because they're like, you have daddy problems. And I say, why do you say that? 
because Juan is just like your dad. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's a very responsible man. He's a he's so smart with money. He's a very respectful man. Like he it's just again, my dad had a very dark side of him in my childhood. But as he grew to understand his issues and going to therapy and starting to see the importance of digging deeper with his issues, he's starting to read books. He's he's like such a big reader now. He's we built like this relationship where it's like, I love my mother to death, but I'd go to my dad mm. first type relationship. Yes. And it and it was a it's a beautiful, you know, it was a beautiful transition because there was just this time where I was just deep down at my worst. And there was a situation where I had to go all in with my dad. Like this is painful. I don't want to be next to you. I don't mm. want to talk to you. I don't even sometimes want to call you my father because I don't feel like that's what you've given me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we had a whole breakdown and seeing my dad cry, it's like the worst feeling. And again, we still have these conversations where sometimes he cries and I'm just like, dad, I forgive you. Like, mm -hmm. I want you to know you're better and that's all I want. You, uh, all I yeah. want you to be. He's a great grandfather. He's like the best grandfather like you could you could ever see. So how do you get from the situation that you were in as a child with him coping the way he did to now having this kind of relationship? Like was there a thing that sparked it? Did it happen over time? Or how do you make such a different relationship with, with someone that you had such a rough time with when you were younger? Well, of course, it's, it definitely take, it takes time. And there was a lot of things that we had to uncover to really get to where we are now. But I think, again, um, going through my darkest times where there was no choice but to confront him mm. because there was so much resentment. There was so much anger in me. There, I was just a very unhappy person in, in relationships in my life. I, like, I was not making very great decisions. And I you know, just took it into my hands, like either we're going to confront it or we're not. And that's where we took it. And I think us taking that time together and figuring it out apart from my mother, apart from my sisters, mm. apart from, it was just me and him hashing it out. I think that's where we grew to learn to talk to each other, to confront each other. Okay. So you, was that you who initiated? No, I got into like an altercation <laughs> um, where I was pretty much to them, I was going crazy mm. um, where they kind of put me in, I don't know if you know what PBH is. It's like Parkview Behavioral Center. Yeah. yeah. So they put me there and it was like a two week stay there, pretty much going through all this therapy uh, I spent the night there. I literally felt like a crazy person. I mean, there was a lot of messed up people there. And I had to go to counseling every day. I had to talk about my issues and go to my go to my core. And he was my core. So, I mean, how old were you when this happened? I was 16, 17. Okay. So, teenager. Yeah. With this upbringing that is complicated with your father. Right. And you're starting to make questionable decisions. Yes. And you end up in PBH yeah. because it's to the point where your family's like, something's not, yeah. not cool here. Yeah, this ain't Hillary. <laughs> right. So then you go in there. What does that do to you? What does that experience do? Um, I think it taught me, um, it just taught me what was wrong with me, you know, like how to figure out what was wrong with me. Um, did you think that there was anything wrong before? Or did I mean, what no. was your mindset? Oh, it was nothing wrong with me. I was, I was just, I felt like I was just being a teenager. Yeah. And I mean, maybe my decisions weren't, you know, the best, but I think I knew something was wrong with me by the relationships that I was keeping around me. Mm. Like a, I was a very, I was in a very unhealthy relationship when I was in high school. And that was from my freshman year to my senior year. And I think from my freshman to my senior year, I changed 
into a whole different person. Mm. Like I literally lost myself. I'd find myself one month, lose myself. It was just an on and off relationship that just lost me. It just, it was just some, again, I'm a big people pleaser. So it was just like, I wanted to make myself happy, but more him. Mm. So I would make decisions. I was I started lying. I started especially to my mom, which wow. that's what that was a scary part. That's how I knew like maybe something's going on where I shouldn't be lying to my mom. I shouldn't be lying to my dad. It's not that deep. It was just like a like I was just scared. I was just scared to tell them the truth. And I think it was that was the only thing that I thought that was wrong with me. Mm. And then once I started figuring out why I was in this relationship and you know, you have when you're in those therapy sessions, you got to tell them what your relationship is with this person mm-hmm. and, uh, that you're in relationship and the troubles that you have with your parents and the troubles you have with your, you know, anybody. So I guess that was the biggest thing is kind of figuring out the the problem. So because in that situation now they're starting to connect dots. You don't even have the and they're capacity. smart with it. Yeah, they they guide you in a very smart way. And the first person they wanted me to meet up with was my dad. Mm, so that sparked. That was a spark. The healing. And then did it keep, did it go well, that initial meet, and then did it get okay. better? Or what oh, was yeah. that like? I think that's where it started. The whole, my dad came in and, you know, we kind of, the biggest thing with me is I was a very, I was, I looked very different compared to my sisters. Mm-hmm. My sisters had black hair. I'm talking about pitch black hair. And I came out with this blondish, brownish hair. And I'm just like, I love myself, you know? Mm -hmm. And it started getting, when I got older, everybody called me a güerita. And I started hearing things about my dad not thinking I was his. Mm. And then my grandmother was like, yeah, your dad didn't think that, you know, you were his. And he was drunk one night and he said this. And and, and I was in high school when I heard that. So again, I was... Going through my shit, and then I hear that, and I'm just like, whoa. And things start probably yeah, clicking yeah. from. Yeah, so so I confronted him about that situation. Like, I heard that you didn't even think I was yours. And I think that's why you beat me so bad. I think that's why you targeted me. I think that's why you blacked out when you, like, mm. I literally can't tell you how bad it would be sometimes because it's just a very dark time for me. Wow. Like, I literally, that's all I remember about elementary. <laughs> like, that's nuts. Yeah. That's nuts. It's very hard. So as you're growing up, relationships starts to get better. Do you start to get back on track? Or what do those, you know, 17 and up years look like? Yeah, so um, I had my kids when I was 20 or 21. It was 2013. Um, and... Once I, I mean, again, I was in that, I was still in that, you know, iffy relationship. Okay. And I was just, um, you know, I was just a very hard-headed person. And that's Mm. one thing about me. I'm a very hard-headed person. And I want to figure things out by myself. Yeah. And I think that's, and that's in anybody's life, you're going to have to figure things out for you to kind of realize what what it really is. Yeah. So once I had my kids, um, I think that's where everything, you know, went you know, to my grind mode. Like Mm. I was a very smart girl in the beginning. Like I always worked. I always had, like I said, I was a very outgoing person. I I had a father as a hustler. I had a mom as an inspiration. Like she was my idol. So it was like, I saw the grind. I knew what it took to be successful. And I'm growing up to think that I'm going to be there one day, even though I'm struggling. Right. So when I had my kids, I'm like, okay, I need to get two jobs to make sure that I'm on my shit because uh, once I found out I was pregnant, um, there was no relationship with this person. Okay. I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do this on my own. Like, I think mm. we need to be apart. And um, I got two jobs. I was working my whole nine months of my pregnancy and I was on my A game. Like, I thought, all right, I could do this. I could do this on my own. Mm. And I... Um, I always, you know, hustled for mine and then they grew up and I just kept working. And it was a very sad time because I didn't get to see my kids grow up because my mindset was I got to get the money. I got to take care of them. Just like you said, it was just as long as they're fed, Mm -hmm. 
they got nice clothes, I'm good. Yeah. But nobody really tells you that you being there is what's... Yeah. And, you know, not everyone gets the option. Right. Right. It's like not everyone gets to stay at home and just be with the kids. Mm -hmm. And that was like with with my parents. My mom got to stay at home a lot, but my dad had to make sure he worked. And you kind of see it with like your parents and how like dad always had to work and didn't have a close relationship with the kids. And uh, but, you know. What else are you going to do? Right. When you have to step up, you have to step up. And I know you well enough to like when you said I just hustled and did it. I'm like, of course you did. Yeah. So then once you have the kids, that kind of helps you get things a little bit more on track. Did it right. keep progressing to that level? Did you stop with the bad influences? Did you start making better decisions? What What was it that, that um, happened as you started gaining that momentum? So definitely kept going. But I started being more, um, what do you say, vigilant Mm -hmm. of it, um, of how I took steps. So, again, when I had my twins, um, for like two years, I was two jobs all the time, making sure they got what they needed, all that good stuff. I got out of that unhealthy relationship. I started thinking more clearly, all right, finding myself is what I need to do. So literally started just being the Hillary that everybody knew. And you could tell I was happier. I was healthier. I would go to the gym every morning. I would, you know, find these ways that I would want my kids to see me and see themselves. Like, I want my kids to see me at my best. So I left the relationship. Mm. I, I wanted them to see me healthy. So I started going to the gym. I wanted them to see me not struggle. Yeah. So I made that happen. And... Um, I think the girls were two years old when I got into a relationship with Juan, which I'm in a relationship with now, which I have two kids mm-hmm. with, and we've been together for seven years. Yeah. So the girls see Juan as their dad. Mm-hmm. They they have their dad and Bobby. Bobby is Juani. Juan is like the guy that makes it happen mm-hmm. for them, you know? So it's like we, you know, my kids have a very... I mean, I set an, like standards for how I want my kids to live and, you know, see life. So just like I saw my mom grind it out, you know, helping people, that's exactly how, you know, it was just like a, it was just like a spark in me. Like, okay, yeah. I have kids and I can be this powerful person, mm-hmm. do it for myself, but also do it for my kids. My kids put that in me. And I always say I owe it to my kids. Well, it's it's going back to like your mom. It's, it's that why. Yeah. It's like, like when we have a reason to make shit happen, we make shit happen. Yeah. Like if you have an hour to do it, you'll do it in an hour. If you have right. a day, you'll do it in a yeah. day. And I love the way that you talk because you've always had the ingredients. Yeah. It's just at what point are you going to start cooking? Yeah. Right? And, you know, we all go through our, our things, some worse than others, but – you know, it makes sense as to why you're looking for answers. You get into wrong situations. Things get really confusing. I think for a lot of people during that time frame, especially if you went through some trauma, things start to get a little confusing. But you went right back to kind of like that energy of, like you said, like I believed I was going to get there at some point. Mm-hmm. And those kids were that kind of a yeah. turning point. So then, I mean, at that point, things started going better for you. Oh, yeah. I, that was the elevation point, I'd mm. say. Like, Again, I was a big worker. Like I, um, I started slowing down. I yeah. started prioritizing. I started. I mean, of course. I mean, they're they're two years old already. So obviously, I l- lost a big part of that. S- those stages where you're talking a little bit more. You're walking. You're. Th- I missed all that because mm. I was working all the time. Yeah. So I definitely regret that. So I make up for it all the time. It's especially with my two. You mean youngest. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, how can I be better? How can I be better for my son? You know, finding that balance and that balance. Every time we talk, I I, I see it like yeah. you're very intentional with your time, what you're doing, things like that. Um, and I think it's super important because you got the example from your mother. You remember how it felt. And again, going back to your mom, when you were a kid, things you experienced, you're trying to make sure your kids don't. Right. So where's the connection into video? What were... What is it that got you into that industry from from the beginning? So I, when I was in high school, like I said, I was I was not all the way out. Like I was not like a, I was not bad through school. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have your issues, but I was at Anthes for um, video production. 
and I loved it, Aaron. I was an anthus too. I was. That's what got me to be a was, designer? It was an obsession. Yeah. Like I found something that I literally could spend all day doing because it was a. I loved always being on camera. Like mm-hmm. I always wanted to be a singer or a teacher. Like I'm a big. Yeah. I still kind of want to be a teacher. Yeah. But I started finding these ways I can connect it. Like, how can I use my talent to direct and to, you know, like use my voice? How can I? And that's a big thing. It's just like being the voice. Mm-hmm. So I always, um, when I was a kid, my my grandfather used to have a camcorder everywhere. Mm-hmm. He has videos of him taking vacations back in the day with my grandma wow. and I get to go back on those. So like we have one of us going to the zoo. So me and my sisters and brothers, we grew up very close when we were uh, younger and then we kind of spread apart when we mm-hmm. got, you know, older. So we can go back to that and see how our relationships were together. It's like we're at the zoo and how close we were. It was beautiful. So it's like docu- for my grandfather to be able to document that. It's just like I want my kids to be able to see that. So I um, I used to go to Anthus, obviously, for video production. I learned all the editing. I went to Skills USA. I got second place. So I had some confidence. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, okay, Hill, you got something I going on. I did Skills USA, too. Yeah, I'm telling you. It was it was also feeling just a part of something right. that gave me, like, that fulfillment. Like, even with my teacher, she was an amazing instructor. She gave me so much attention. She knew the talent that I had, and she, she fed me with – all the confidence that I needed. And how important is that? I mean, it's so important. Relating it back to your mom, I talk about, you know, my teacher at Anthos, Karen Gilly. She would drive me to competitions. Woo. She was she's the one who got me to join Skills USA, National Technical Honor Society. Yes. She took me under her wing because she saw that potential. And it's very similar to your mom of like, yeah. you know, oh, yes. my parents didn't have the knowledge or capacity to yep. teach me those things. Mm-hmm. So she's the one who came in and said, hey, this, this, is this. And, you know, I talk about Anthos and her a lot because I'm a designer because of that. Yes. And when I wasn't, you know, when I wasn't legally able to work, that's what saved me. Oof. I became an entrepreneur because I had to, not because I wanted to. 16 years old, 17 with business cards. Let me do these $70 logos to get some money because I didn't have any other way. And if it wasn't for that kind of attention, that thing of like, hey, let's get you focused and get you, it would have never happened. And right. it seems like you have a super similar story. Right. And it's, again, it was a very, uh, high school was a very iffy time for me. You know, I was just like up, down, up, down, up, down. I think it was my junior year, I dropped out of high school. Mm. But... Miss Y is still let me come to class. Wow. And she was like, I don't even know if I could do that. So let's hope. Anthus, listen, she's a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but she stayed with me. She trusted me. She didn't, yeah. okay, you're not in school anymore. You can't be in my class. Right. No, it was like, hey, as long as you're doing Genuine your thing. Genuine care. Yes, yes. And again, um, she gave me the direction I needed. She gave me the confidence I needed. So that's definitely something that was like here in my brain. It was still something that I held on to. Yeah. And the video started um, when I started doing my YouTube. I think it was like 2010, 2000. It was 2010, 2011 when I started doing my YouTube. And obviously YouTube was pretty popping back in 2011, Mm -hmm. 2010. So I would you know, in Anthos, I would upload videos. And then um, I started, you know, I just got a computer. I got a camera for my birthday. I was like, okay, let's start this up again. I would do makeup videos. I would do videos of just like my life with my children, getting them ready, um, you know, taking them to different places like trips and stuff. So I I started with that. And then this um obviously covid was a huge uh turnaround you know mm-hmm. there was a lot going on during covid so you had the black lives My- uh, matter movement that was just huge and i think that's what made me so excited about film because i could document mm-hmm. that uh, rally that was downtown at yeah, the courthouse. Yeah. I was able to document that, like people documented the rallies back in the day. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a big part of this. Listen, I wish I was on the news and helped, you know, document it. Mm-hmm. Like we are downtown, 
But I did what I could by yeah. bringing my camera and not knowing what the hell I was doing, but capturing what I knew I could use to tell the story. You saw the opportunity and you're I'm, like, let's just dive in. Honestly, one of my friends was like, hey, there's this rally and I think you need to bring your camera. I wow. literally was not going to come. I got a babysitter last minute. I was like, let's go. It really is about your circle. It really is about my circle. Yeah. And and this was my one of my friends from a long time ago. And I wasn't doing any video work. And he was like, bring your camera. Let's do this. And I was like, okay. Just got my gimbal for the first time. This is my first time using my gimbal. <laughs> and I'm going in. Mm. And I am going in. And I think, again, I was around like a movement. My mm -hmm. mom put in her sweat and yeah. tears over... Um, there was a a rally that they had at Southside that was like um, for the immig uh, immigration. Like mm -hmm. seeing my mom being able to do that. All right, I'm gonna replicate this somehow. I don't know how I'm gonna do it. So you were I, prepped. Yes, for it. exactly. I knew what people wanted to see and what they needed to see, mm. and that's what I gave it. It's called um, No Justice, No Peace, and it was probably the turning point of my actual video career. Because that showed me, I'm I'm like bawling my eyes out, Aaron, even editing this. Yeah. Because it started off as a an edit where it was all color. I used the raw footage, all that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is not enough. This is not enough just to put this. Yeah. So I start putting facts of the history of all the abuse and all of the incidents that, you know, police, you know, injustice has you know, done. You told the story the I way it needed to be told. I told the story it needed to be. And just how intense it was. Every, every, every song I put in there, every shot I put in there, I wanted to make sure people understood it behind the music, behind, I mean, in front of their face. Like it's all a touch feel, what is it called? Touch feel see type thing. Yeah. Like yeah. you, you don't, you have to experience it and live it and be a part of it. And that's right. that's the thing, you know, with most things, like until you're in there, you know if it's right. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's the music I needed. That's the, because you're telling a story using all of these different elements that need to work together. Yeah. So I can already see it. You have the interest. Yep. You have this big, passionate why of like, I, I'm called to this. You had the friend who hooked it up. Yeah. And all of this came together and you made this project. What did you do with it? What, what was the end product. So um, I put it on Facebook and that's where it blew up because mm. it was right after. I literally put it out two days after the rally. Wow. It was a black and white film. Mm. So think of how much even more intense that yes. is because we're not worried about who, what color who it and what color you're wearing. No, it's all black and white. This is intense and all we care about is the story behind it and what's happening. So... Um, I'm getting so much feedback by everybody. So everybody's hitting me up like, Hillary, do you do videos? Do you do blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, no, I don't. But I'm like, whoa, like this is, this is, I'm obviously doing something right yeah. now. I'm obviously, you know, everybody keeps saying, I cry. So I'm just like, this obviously is like an emotion thing. Like I'm, I'm putting out an emotion people can't put together. This is my work, not... Aaron's work. Mm -hmm. Like you can put together something that's going to give somebody else a different feeling. You know, you're going to go off of what you feel. That was representative of you. Yes, because I feel the emotion. I'm a very emotional person. So when I do anything, any type of work, this could be for your business, Aaron. Any video work that I do, I put my all into mm -hmm. it. I put my emotion to it. I give you what you would want yeah. and what I would want, you know. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing was getting all that feedback and, again, getting that confidence boost because I already got it up here yeah and it's waiting there for me yeah and I'm already doing all this work and I'm just like okay let me start taking it more seriously I already had a logo through my YouTube and I still have it till this day and I'm gonna keep it forever <laughs> um it's my name Ilaria Heredia and I'm gonna love it represent me because uh, uh the hugest the hugest the biggest thing for me is my the pride that my family represented Heredia is like a very prideful last name. They were very proud of them, themselves. And I'm going to keep that even when I get married. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm with Mark it. Mark my words. Okay? I'm with it. And um, so I, and people were even giving me comments on, on my uh, logo. They're like, that is hot. Like yeah. it's a black and white. 
So when it was put on my film, they're like, yo, like, Hill, you got this. Well, because everything you created was a representation of you. Yeah. And I think people recognize that. And that's where the uniqueness comes. I mean, I've been a graphic designer for a long time. I was a wedding photographer for a while. There's so many creative endeavors. And I think when you get started, a lot of people's goals is how do I get it to look like something, like this person's or whatever, right? So we start to adopt all these styles and techniques of people we see or things we like. But at some point where you start to get comfortable, you start doing things your way. You can look at something and be Ooh. like, that is me. Yes. Not me trying to copy. But it takes you copying. It, t- it takes you trying to do things that you're like, ooh, I like that. Ooh, this makes sense. I mean, my interview style, right? The way that I do things, the events that we put together are indicative of me, but it took a lot of trying, testing things out. And it's just the best thing you could do, I think, with anything, but more so with creative endeavors is put out you. Right. And it takes a ton of time, effort, failure to get to that you. Ooh, and that that's in business. That's mm-hmm. in your own life. Mm-hmm. You you heard my story and where I ended up at. And I think once I put out that project and got the confidence that I needed and the the closest people to me were like, Hillary, this is you. Yeah. You got this. Keep doing this. Mm-hmm. I f- I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, wow. Like, I've been waiting for this moment to figure out what's for me. And this is what makes me my happiest. Yeah. And I'm going to continue doing it. And Even if it doesn't feel good. That, right. I mean, and not feel good, but feel it. Like, because we never know what's it. Mm-hmm. But me going out there and filming that and putting this video together, if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have found it. Right. And that's the important thing. Like, you're never going to go into the straight line of where you belong. It's this thing. I I talk about this thing a lot where in my early 20s, I made a decision to say, I'm going to say yes to opportunity, <laughs> no matter where it is. That turned me, long story short, from a graphic designer to someone who learned how to develop websites. I was a wedding photographer for a long time. Um, I did social media marketing and just all sorts of little things. But all of those things taught me how to get to where we are today. I'm comfortable working with people who know cameras. I'm not the best, but I've done it. Yes. I know how to take photos enough to where I can work with photographer. And all of that led me to who I am and what I am now, which is, you know, producing beautiful things and having real authentic conversations. Because as a graphic designer, I talk to small business owners and I'm like, oh, we're all scared. We're all trying to figure this out. But no one talks about it in the open. So that's why this transformed into like what we're doing now, which is just having really real conversations. But I wouldn't have been right here in this moment with you if I didn't go do everything and not only figure out what I wanted to do, but what I didn't. Mm. It's not only about Ooh. where you belong, but where you don't. Yes. Because now I don't even look at that stuff because I don't even need to be there. And I'll keep pushing into this every single time because you I hear it in just about every conversation I have is your circle matters. Right. When you have people that say, I'm proud of you and you are part of my circle. I've called you. I'm like, hey, I'm having a shit day. What's up? Like, tell me something. And we and we deliver and we do that with one another. We lift each other up when we're feeling great. We we pull each other up when we're not doing so hot. And, you know, we make the space to be like, it's not always going to feel good. Mm -hmm. Video projects are going to go bad. Um, You're going to you know, miss budget things. You're going to have to swallow some hard pills you don't yes. want to, but it's a part of the struggle. And I think it's not till you get a little you further trust down the line. your struggle. Exactly. It's yours. And at the end of the day, you're the one that has to live it. You're the one that has to survive it. And the lessons are on the other side of that. And I think people try and scrape by without any scars or damage. Oh, I love that. You it's can't. It's true. It's true. It's and, and I think that's what I love about talking to you about my struggles is that you, you tell me time and time again that it's okay and this it's normal. Yeah. It's normal because the biggest thing, people don't think it's normal. Yeah. And until you have those conversations with yourself mm-hmm. and with other people, you're never going to get to that point where it's like, okay, you got to find that resilience. And I say that through, you know, um, when I did that piece, um, that was in 2020. And I, I just had my son in December of 2019. So it was just, 
it was a lot going on mm-hmm. while, you know, in it, and I'd like to say almost to my prime because I felt like that's where I started being on my on my A game and then it slipped. Hmm. And that's that was the biggest scare. It was like I was just I was just on top. Yeah, yeah. And then out of nowhere, I had a health issue where I couldn't get up and I couldn't go out and shoot and mm. I had to start canceling and it was just like, okay, there's nothing at after this. Like I can't get back up. But I remember getting in contact with you and I'm like, I literally can't do the regular stuff anymore. I can't get up and make my kids food. I can't, um, you know, go and take a run or a walk. Like I literally yeah. can't physically do it. And you kept saying, hey, this is a a short time thing. You're going to get better. Stay in your right mindset. Like, do what you can. So stop thinking about what you can't do. mm -hmm. Try and figure out what you can do for now. Work on yourself. Read books. It was Uh, the learning, Yeah, it was the learning process. You did tell me that. Master your craft. And then when you're ready to go, you go out there and do it. Soak up what you Mm -hmm. can now. So when you are able to do it. Yeah. You go and, and do it. And I think that whole 2020 was when I started reading more books about my mindset um, and, you know, my habits. And because for a long time I was taking on projects, scheduling, like, okay, I'm using my calendar. I'm like, I, I've got this week open. And I had every week filled. And I'm like, yo, at the end of the day, I have to edit all these projects mm-hmm. that I'm filming. Mm-hmm. So I was working myself to the bone. I literally had no energy for my kids. I literally was not eating right. I was not exercising. I was yeah. like beat. And we go back to that cycle of now like, oh, mom also was trying to find that balance. Yes. Yeah. And I always tell my mom, the, I promise that I'm going to be, I'm always going to remember what you have done so I can change it. So yeah. I will never work my self to the bone and not take care of my home first, Mm -hmm. which she always takes that as I'm proud of you because, you know, that was her first scare when I started getting into this video stuff because she's like, what are you doing? Because she's so used to me being there whenever she, what are you doing? I'm going to do this meeting. Oh, I'm going to film. She's like, Hillary, how are the kids? I'm like, they're good, mom. I promise you. Like, yeah. I just spent three hours with them at Jungle George's. I, I got this. It's that like, next generation yeah. of we're doing better. Then your kids are going to do better. And she and sees that. She sees, you know what? You're learning. Yeah. You're you're figuring out how to balance your time. Yeah. And I thought that whole process of me being sick and be able to soak up all that knowledge and, go, and finding myself in anything, which was taking on opportunities with people that, you know, fed my brain, fed my fed my soul. That's what healed me to be the person that I am today. And and I'm always struggling, but I'm Well, but, it's a constant battle. Yes. Right. And we get better. Yep. And we've talked a lot. We've recommended a lot of books. We talk about podcasts because that's what it is. You there's no separation between business and personal. Yes. It intermingles, right? Yes. Your home shit affects your work shit. Your work shit affects your home Ooh. shit. And when people try and set, like, it doesn't work that way. So you have to figure out those ways to maneuver it. Like, you have to feel good about home in order to feel excited about work and not feel guilty. Yes. So let me ask you this, because I don't have this perspective at all. You're a mother. Yes. You're going to school and you're running this this business now. Number one, how the hell do you do it? Number two, what would you tell, you know, someone, um, a mother who is looking to start a business and has kids and has these responsibilities and doesn't even know where to start or how to find that balance? What are some of the things that that helped you that could help them? Nourishing your mind, cleansing the negative and learning how to turn those things into positive. Again, trying to trust yourself and and in positions where you belong. I know for a long time I would I I was scared to put myself in opportunities that I didn't feel like I belonged there. Mm-hmm. I you belong there, you just need to trust yourself yeah. into being in those in in that chair. You and know? that's so hard. I deserve to be in this chair with you, Aaron. Yes. All right. And of course and it's it's um trial and error. Taking on those opportunities, the as many opportunities as you can take, take them. That yeah. fit where you're trying to go. Yeah. Just know where you're trying to go always and make sure that you're having, again, the quality people in your life. You always have to 
be reevaluating your circle mm-hmm. all the time. It's a constant thing. It's a constant you thing. You grow, you change. And sometimes it's scary, Aaron, because it's the closest people to you that you can't detach yourself. And the, those some of those relationships are what's going to get you to the next level. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. cutting those dead ends. Yeah. And it's like I said earlier, sometimes the time doesn't matter, right? Like I met you... And it's crazy to hear about your past before I met you because you were so different and you were lost and trying to... I've always known this. Yeah. So as soon as I met you, we're both outgoing. We're both super friendly. It was kind of like, of course. Like, I brought you right in. You passed through the gates and just went right in because, like, I understood that I need more of, of, of Hillary and people like that in my life. But on that other sense... I've lost friendships with people that I've known for 15 years because at some point it's just not the same. And you're right. It is scary. But when you're feeling down, when you feel like you don't belong, when you feel like you don't find the balance, when you think you're not good at it, you need to have someone to be like, hey, yes, I'm in this little hole and they'll pull you out next day. You're on the grind. And that's what I love about the relationship we have. Yes. And I hear it in your story and I hear it in mine of like, you're not always going to be able to pull yourself up. You're going to need people to help you. And you're a people pleaser. I'm a people pleaser too. And I I, I know we're both working on it. But what I'm really – what I struggle with a lot that I'm actively working to get better on is asking for help. Yes. Not always being the one to pull people up. Yeah. But also being the one that says, hey, help me out here. Yeah. We can't do everything. And I think that's also a tip. Yeah. Stop thinking that you can do everything. Mm -hmm. Start outsourcing I have somebody cleaning my home because I can't. Yeah. I have four kids. My my house does not stay clean. <laughs> so how can I run a business, you know, have quality time with my kids and, and my partner, mm-hmm. but also give the quality me? I yeah. have to be on my A game. Yes. You have to take care of you yes. in order to be able to be the, the mother you want to be, the partner you want to be, the daughter, and then the professional you want to be. Yes. And I love what you said about reevaluating because it's never the same. No. We're changing every day. We learn something. We get better at this. And that's kind of where I am now in my 30s. Of My 20s was take opportunity. Mm-hmm. I've learned a lot. Now my 30s is how do I buy my time back? How do I spend Ooh. less time working? Because when I when I have kids, I want to be able to spend a year with my kids. Yeah. Not have to work. Not have my wife have to work. Not have to find a sitter. Because I've dealt with that. And I understand why. But it's like my job is to elevate it to the next level. So how do I at 30 figure out how to not have to work as hard but still fill my passion and help other people and all of that? And once you're on there, you, you think different. You make different decisions. And – those plans change constantly. I forgot the word that Dawn used in your last last episode, but she was talking about what she wants to give to people so they don't have to re, um, mm. you know, reencounter the issues that she went through yeah. to get where she's yeah. at. And I always say I'm trying to give people the keys. Yeah. And I think that's why I put together my podcast. Because there was so much that I went through because I put myself through it and I could have trusted myself a little bit more. I could have done more work inside myself for me to elevate, Mm -hmm. you know, quicker, faster, faster. easier. And it's so funny because you said, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to buy my time. Like, I'm, I've lost so many years of my life where time, it, looks so much differently mm-hmm. to me. I don't play with time. I am like, it's scary how how time f- flies. Yeah. And I am like on my A game all day. So I mean, I'm not going to say all the time, but because I need to accomplish what I know I can accomplish. And there's no sitting on it anymore. I've done enough sitting exactly. back in my in, back in my days. I'm ready to go all in. And, and, and that's, this is going to, wake so many people up years before they would have figured it out on their yes. own. And that's that's why we're here, right? We're here to give back and, yes. and, and to help. So um, talk to me a little bit about the podcast. The podcast was put together by me and my friend Marissa. It's called To the Closed Mind because I feel like it's really in your mind. You don't – it's like a, a waking moment. That's mm. when your mind opens to anything. That's 
to the people that you're dealing with every day. Like maybe this job is not for me or maybe this relationship is not for me. Like uh, opening your mind to a better you, to a better, you know, um, to just like the, I like to say your better self, like you have levels to the, to the game. You got your lowest self, all right, I'm cool. And then you got your prime. The potential that you were always meant to reach, that oftentimes like we're the ones who keep ourselves down here. Yes. Because I think about that a lot and I'm like, man, why have I been struggling so much? Why this or that? And I'm like, it's not, no one is telling me no. Yeah. I'm just not asking. Yeah. And once you do that, you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> I need to start asking more. And but, you know, it, it, it takes it takes time and it takes someone to talk about yeah. it in order for people to even think about it, because so many times we don't make our life. Our life just kind of happens to mm. us. And whenever you let life happen to you, you're always going to end up under your potential because the easiest path to travel is not the one that is the most worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Like in order to get to the top, you got to climb and climbing is hard. Yep. But when, like you said, once you have your eyes on the prize, once you have a path. You know what you have to do. And we like to play the blaming game mm-hmm. when really it's us. Yeah. Like we're the problem and we don't want to see it. And that's the biggest thing is looking ourselves in the mirror. Accountability. Accountability. A hundred percent. I think that's the biggest thing for people to know that we got to start doing work. Like it, we're trying to, we're all trying to take the easy way out. Yep. Like, and that's not how it works. We got to show what's reality. And that's opening your mind to, all right, maybe you got to come up with strategic ways to be successful. How am I going to get to where I need to be? All right, so I need to change my habits. And and we talk about the the first season is all about self-care and how we get ourselves to be a, like a solid rock, to yeah. be able to like – Resilience. Um, we talk about again healthy habits. Um, talking to yourself nicely. Like mm-hmm. we we don't understand. We we are the problem, and we are like the the we are the wall in front of us. Mm-hmm. Like and and I love to keep going back to these episodes because I'm not always at the top. Yeah. I'm I'm all, I can go to my lowest, and then I listen to one of those podcasts. I'm like Hillary, mm-hmm. you already told yourself. Yeah, and that's the thing for me. Whenever I I make any content. To, in any form, I always say, this is a reminder to me. Yes. Anyone who needs to self. hear it, anyone who needs to hear it is a bonus, but I'm I'm saying this here for me. Yes. And you have to give yourself those reminders. And another documentation of, you know, what you really are, who you really are. Exactly. And never, n- always, you know, and I like to journal because you can kind of say, all right, mm-hmm. I was okay then, I'm going to be okay today. Yes. Your, your situation is not permanent. And yeah. when you're in it, it feels so permanent. Yeah. Oh, it does. But so many traumas, so many things, you're like, I'm never going to. And then here we are yeah. sitting, talking about life and all right. whatever situation we thought we were never going to get out of, we got out of it. So talk to me. Um, what are your projects right now? What are you spending your time on? So I'm in school. That's my main focus <laughs> is passing and prioritizing that because Mm. again I love to um feed my brain I love to kind of get these small keys that I don't know yet yeah and apply them to my business what are you Um, studying so I'm studying entrepreneurship um I'm trying to bring my business to another level and a professional level because Mm -hmm. again I'm in my infancy of my business. I I exactly and figuring out how I want to do business, the quality of business I want to do that's going to differentiate myself from all these other, you know, businesses. But is this what I want to do in in general, or do I want to bring a branch it out? Because the one thing that I do want to do is work with young, you know, high school, middle school because. That's what I saw my mom doing, and that that fed my soul, and that fed her soul, and I want to. It's like a legacy. Like I want to be able to teach, teach what I know now, mm-hmm. not just about the work of what I'm doing in my business, which that's going to be a, a big plus, and that's right. why I'm going to school. But for me to be able to um, relate to these kids is just another way that I can feed my soul and f- 
and and feed theirs. I love it. Yeah. So hopefully getting into that. And um, I really, uh, we're on our second um, season for To The Closed Mind podcast. Um, and again, just trying to re, re, re would you say refine? Mm-hmm. Refine my business. Get that next level. Yeah. But slowly and surely, again, staying balanced is my top priority. I'm not trying to move too fast, but just doing the right things. Yeah. The present moment. Love it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate any time we get to spend together. Yes. And knowing how you are with your time, I'm always so grateful that you decide to spend any of it with me. So super proud of you, super happy. And I'm I'm excited in a in a kind of um, a selfish way because I know I'm going to get front row to just see all the super great things you do in the next few years. Yeah, you're always my go-to guy. Mm. Love you so much. Thank you, you for being here. Thank you. Everybody.